Right, moving on to the next session, you have to imagine a nice log fire there, throw a log on the fire, we're going for the fireside chat. Um, our next guest, um, probably almost self-introduced already, but um, I'd just like to paint a picture, rather than what he's done, I'd like to say who he is. Um, Sir Terry Matthews is probably the most passionate technology entrepreneur that I've ever met. Somebody who is always inquisitive, somebody who always wants to find the way, and finally a person who makes big things happen that others look at and think is not possible. So just a little bit of background, a founder and chairman of Wesley Clover, which is his investment company. Terry has invested in over a hundred technology companies across a whole spectrum of TMT. You will know a number of the names that Terry has founded. He founded Mitel, which he still chairs, an enormous company that has a big impact on our, on our industry. He founded Newbridge Networks and sold Newbridge Networks for multi-billion, multi-tens of billions. Um, he has also innovated in a huge number of other smaller and still um, invest in smaller companies. And I'm sure through our discussion he'll share his thoughts on, on doing that. And when it comes to making big things happen, there's not many people who can singularly decide that we should hold the Ryder Cup in Wales, which he's extremely passionate about promoting Wales. Put Wales on the map in one of the nicest hotels in the country that Terry has created. And you add to that, because we're going to talk about complexity and managing and taking risks, is to hold the G8 summit at your hotel is no mean feat because there are one or two risks, and there is a challenge, and Terry's done all those. So Terry, welcome to the stage, welcome to the Fireside Chat, thank you for coming. Now Steve, that wasn't quite right, it was actually the NATO World Summit. Ah, close. And I, I don't think anyone would have ever had a convention or a conference with a couple of aircraft carriers as part of the convention. That's kind of on the heavy end of the scale. But uh, what an unbelievable uh, event that was. It, it must have been unbelievable. I know even with the WBA, and talked to the WBA team about creating this conference and all the complexity. And navigating and, and having ships uh, with all the firepower to protect the NATO oh. summit must have been unbelievable. And to say nothing of the fairways being chewed up by a couple of fighter jets taken off, that was a little different as well. <laughs> so you can see where this far side chat's going. Anyway, Ter Terry and I have got to know each other extremely well. Um, always, it's Steve, you've got 10 minutes to have a chat. And we start to sit on the phone, I said, I'll be down for dinner. Hour and a half later, and I was in a restaurant, and Terry would go, oh, Steve, what about, and I go back into the restaurant, and it gives me advice then of what to say to my wife in returning. <laughs> so this is the sort of passion and guidance that you can get. It's about fun. About fun. So Terry, let me, let me ask a question. You, you've seen it, you've been party to a little bit of it this morning, about the amount of change that's going on. And I've watched you scribbling, I've watched you with the phone calls, why does all this change interest you so much? Well, you, you, you began by explaining quite rightly that, that I've become knowledgeable about how to create companies from scratch. The Mitel company, as an example, was started in 1972 with $4,000 that I borrowed. And an interesting thing, just to show you how much change can affect things, 10 years later, Every dollar became two and a half million dollars, so there were 40 million shares by that time at 58 US a share. I leave it for you to work out the mathematics, but I mean, that was only 10 years later. So many people became quite wealthy who were the employees and the shareholders and so on. And uh, is this not working? Can people in the back here? It may be rubbing on the shirt. It is rubbing on the shirt. Does this work? Yes, it does. Yeah, so, so my, my history of starting companies up, and just as David mentioned earlier, I, a huge part of this is when there's change. If there's no change, 
then you're dealing often with very large companies that have boards of directors, chief execs, VPs, EVPs, managers, and so on. And the time cycle, the time constant to a new product might be many years. Because you always go back and say, do you have the budget to do that? Whereas a small company has no baggage, no clients. They're basically a little guerrilla team. And the more changes there are, the more upside opportunities there are to go after the client, listen to the client. Remember, this would be client pull, not client push. So what are we dealing with here? I mean, just within the, uh, the presentations today, you're dealing with, what did we call it, wireless? Was it, uh, was it Wi-Fi? Was it some 5G? I mean, good God, the growth, the demand for network capacity has gone through the roof. We can all relate to that. And the need, therefore, for changes, and therefore the important thing for anyone in it to understand there will be some new companies that come up because the change allows them to get in. And there will be some very valuable companies that come out of that. So my entire career in business, as soon as I started the first company, has been taking advantage of change listening to clients. If a client says they want something and you deliver it, they'll probably buy it. So that's a philosophy that I follow. So I want, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. I know that most people in the room set will be thinking, how does he do it? Because I think that, how does he do it? Mm -hmm. So what's your personal technique of being able to navigate? What's the right opportunity? What, what do you personally do? I listen watch listen to clients. Yeah. First of all, listen to clients relate to people, and by the way, persistence, the single most important word to success, persistence, you never give up. And I am an extremely persistent individual. Mm. And then with the team, make sure you share the rewards. That's an important piece part. The problems are for the large companies that don't move quick enough. Now in this particular industry, yeah. it is going to move very quick. Today it's a mess. I mean, what, 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 what did you work out of a path out of this, this extremely complicated environment? And connectivity is a global thing. It's not just a city, not just a nation. It's a global affair that you're dealing with. So this is a global issue. Who's running it? Who's controlling it? So that takes us to another point. Is this a GSM thing? Ah, oh, it's an interesting thing. Or is it a Wi-Fi association? Or is it, in fact, like the broadband, uh, wireless broadband alliance, Who, who's running this? Well, we, we, we know that if you look at the competitive landscape of the global cloud phase, cloud means global, right. telco often means country. Right. So what's your feeling about that? How, how do the telcos navigate that world? Because that's what, what the challenge and debate becomes. It becomes, how do I make myself relevant particularly when a company is valued so much and therefore it's got a lot of resources, in a world where your domain and your heartland is in a geography. Well, I mean, it's, it is a mess. <laughs> yeah. If I take you to the Champs-Élysées in Paris, there's free Wi-Fi. We talked about New York, there's free wi How do you make money out of that? Yeah. How do you monetize that? How do you pay for that? Yeah. Is it a city responsibility? Are we all going to be communists and all join Russia and then everything is everybody's equal? Trouble is, some are a little more equal than others, as I recall, because I've been back and forth many, many times. So how do you get out of this? Broadband wireless is an absolute change beyond belief, and we can all relate to it. Yeah. And not only that, but a huge prop proportion of it is mobile. Your mobile, your car's mobile, IoT things might be mobile. So it has to be wireless. Yeah. And then, by the way, before you forget that little set of words, wouldn't, how big is China? You can remove the population of the UK out of China. You could add France, and they wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> and I didn't add India. And what's the population of Indonesia? Was it 380 million people? You could take the UK and France out of Indonesia, and they wouldn't know, they wouldn't know the difference. The world is getting connected. And too many people in Europe, including the people in the UK, they don't yet understand the size of Asia 
and the effect it has. They still don't quite get it, mm. in my view. As so far as I'm concerned, I'm global. You see the eyes beginning to change, the color beginning to change to look like India, the wobbling of the head. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I like global. Yeah. And I live global. And I start up companies globally. And I can tell you, that is the way to behave. Take the borders down. Here's a very simple example for you. You might have a new tech company in London. Yeah. And you might say, Terry, I'm really lucky. I've got 100% of the market in London. Unfortunately, the problem for you is you didn't get any of your technology in the US or China or India or France or Germany. It's only time before you're dead meat. The important thing is if you've got something which is differentiated and, in de and a desirable thing by clients, you must find one way or another to take it to other borders, and then you gain the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Then somebody from Silicon Valley that might even have a better product, they try to land in France, they try to land in Germany, they try to land in China, unfortunately the low-hanging fruit's gone, then they have a massive uphill battle. You must land and expand fast in the today world. Yeah, we heard that from David with the pace, the need for innovation. Right. I, I'm going to take you another avenue now because there's so many interesting things we can talk about by this fire. Um, you talked about India and you talked about the pace and change. Um, there's massive challenges in amongst all this exciting 5G of the unconnected. You've got it, certainly, with India and places that have got massive expanses of land. But you've even got it in UK. And you've got it in your homeland, in Wales. Um, you know, an enormous amount of, of villages are challenged. What's your feelings about with technology and how the use case, business case, how can we improve that situation? Well, first of all, think about a farm. Think about a, a village somewhere. Uh, the fact is, wireless, there are, there are many long-range ways of using wireless. I mean, we talk about, for instance, LoRa as an example. Yep, I know, it's very not low bandwidth, got it. But it has huge advantages. How about street lighting? Much of it going to LED. LED going on and off with the daylight. Powered probably most of the time now with ducts. So if you go down the road five or ten years from now, just the power savings by moving to LED lighting would be huge for any government. And then on top of that, if you say, well, I'm going to have networked automobiles, well, don't they go on roads? Don't the roads have lights? Don't the lights have power? Don't the lights have ducting? I mean, how do you pay for this stuff? It could be that there's some special relationship with towns, villages, cities, yeah. more often than not, the government pays for the lighting. Much of it might be paid just by the re reduced power costs by moving to better lighting. And by the way, if it's networked, if you say, well, you know, the power, can the power be backed up? Even if it's not backed up and there's outages, people can still live with that. We heard earlier on, uh, you know, can people live without Wi-Fi? And that's a very good question. Mm. I'm beginning to think I'll shut off Facebook and Netflix at work because I think the economy would shoot up. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Well, I, I, t I told you this, and I told a few of the audience when I came into the hotel, this is the significance of Wi-Fi, and the receptionist said to me, oh, you were going to a conference, which one? I said, I work for the future Wi-Fi. They said, you are my savior. You know, suddenly I found out that I was important yeah, um, probably the most significant thing. The, the, uh, on that rural aspect, have you been involved in any technology innovations to bring to rural communities more broadband? And, I, and the reason I ask that is that with cloud, it means more and more services are going to be available and need to be available through broadband. My, my mother, for example, without internet of any great such as AT5, right. she can't buy your things, organize, somebody else got to do it because she hasn't been able to get that connection where she happens to be and she, she, she's got a challenge. But there's an enormous amount who could do it but haven't got the ability. She could be in rural villages, not enough broadband capacity, 
to not do the things that we are creating. Mm -hmm. So have you seen any of that? Well, I, I have a couple of things to talk about that. I started up a company called Dragon Wave in Canada. It was the first company to do meshed backhaul. Yeah. You have a downpour of rain, cut off, it just reverses the, uh, the network. It's not, it's not oven spoke. Mm. And so that makes it much more reliable, let's say, for any particular area. That, that was very popular in the United States. Again, to get to areas that were otherwise not so easy to get to. The other thing that's very important in my history was the changes that happened in Cornwall right. with European Union and BT funding where fiber to every premise was put in. Now that's been in now for well over five years, but after five years, they checked the economics. Now for those in the audience that don't know about Cornwall, it's the most southwest part of the UK. There are no cities. There are towns, lots of villages, lots of farming areas. But here's the interesting thing. With cash provided, fiber was put into every premise. What I like is the outcome from the economic side. Yeah. The economic growth after five years is a four times increase in economic output for the county. Wow. There's a little thing in my mind, therefore, that speaks about countries and cities. Take London. I mean, by far, in many finance sectors, the leader on the planet. If it's not brought in in an optimum way, someone else can take out the city of London in different sectors because they're just better networked. Think maybe Shanghai. Yeah. Think maybe Singapore. Yeah. Uh, now, it's very difficult for a country like the UK to compete if much of the funding is government funded. A private company can't really fight an yeah. entire government. And often, I think in the UK and in the US, the comparisons are made and say, well, we're not as good as X, X, X. But then if it's government funded, you, you, you can't, fee you can't fight it. Picture. Now, just pretend you're on the sofa, and now you're part of this. So any questions for, for Terry? Steve, I like history. And there's a lot to be learned from looking at the time of canals. There's a lot to be learned from the time of rail. And what I mean by that is the original big engineer for railways was Brunel, seven foot gauge rail, way beyond its time. But unfortunately, regulation came around and said, all rail has to be connected, and it'll be four foot eight and a half. All of the rolling stock, all of the rails, all of the stations had to be changed. If I was the CEO, it would have almost driven me insane to change out stuff that was otherwise state of the art. So sometimes being first or being, being the best may not always be the best outcome. Look at DSL, thousand dollars a line in 19, when was that Steve, 1990? A thousand dollars a line. Today the technology I think is about $15. What if BT had said, we're gonna give everybody broadband with DSL? thousand dollars a line on the equipment. Yeah, you wouldn't be doing anything else. No, you'd be bankrupt. Yeah. So timing in life is almost everything. G dot fast, new technology for those lines. You're dealing with hundreds of megabits, but at what cost? And how quickly will the cost come down? Well, that was the debate that was posed with David, because when, as we know, the services and the valuations and the money heading towards those were free, then the innovation, the investment, and the flow back down through the chain from service provider providing big back is the dynamic for the industry. And uh, it's crucial. I'm going to ask the, the audience if they've got any questions. Question over, over here. On the subject of persistence, which is a very important keyword, um, we've seen even the large corporations go down in, in some cases because they insist on certain ideas. So the question is, when do you know when to pivot? change your direction or stop an idea completely? Well, again, timing in life is everything. I can't tell you when timing is right in any particular line item because in this particular industry, almost everything is up for change. So how you do it on, on the timing, you really have to be wise. I, I highly recommend a couple of books. Just, just 
just learn a little bit about history and you can get a hell of a lot from it. One of the best books I ever read, you might make a note of this, is called The Wedding of the Waters. Now you might say, what the hell has that got to do with 5G and wireless? What you might like is to read about the complexity of the history and how that one book will tell you how the US became the United States. You couldn't cross over the Appalachian chain of mountains. You couldn't get there on horse and cart. Had to be crossed some way or other. Use the shocker. The Erie Canal was put in with London money. New York City was made with London money. That's how long ago the relationship is tight. Think about 1820s, and that one canal was the way from the east of the US, the original English states, over to the west, and it created continental US. And the complexities, the type of cement, the raising of the levels of the water, how you come down to the Hudson from the Mohawk, it goes on and on and on, politically complicated, management complicated, technology complicated, but it made the United States. There's a lot to be learned from that. So history can teach you a huge amount of things. We are at that kind of point today in wireless networks. Yes, we are. And much of what's needed to be invented for the next bit, you read about rails, and what happened there, you read about canals and you say, good God, there's an incredible similarity. Read about it. It's called The Wedding of the Waters. It'll be one of the best reads you've ever had. Any other questions? Question over here. Hi, Terry. So um, in, if you go back to history. Sorry, who am I speaking to? Sorry, Richard. Okay, thank you. Um, you look at, say, the telecommunication, the profits from the telecommunication era paid for the internet era, the profits from the early internet era paid for the mobile, and then, as in people that made money, go back and invest in companies in the next wave. And you're looking at, say, the internet era has paid for a lot of the investment and in R&D in the app kind of era that we're in now. Do you think that will go on, obviously, into AI and other things, or do you think that it will start to taper off the amount of companies that get launched, the amount of money that's been willing to burn on new technology. Remember, it's when there's change, there's the opportunities. And when changes are violent as they're going on right now, the biggest companies have a time constant that works against them. Because every large company will have an overseeing board of directors, a CEO, often they're thrown out because they can't get the financial results they forecast. Like, this, this is a time of dramatic change. There is no two ways about it. And it's when there's dramatic changes that the opportunities are the biggest. Now, in my case, there's about 70 companies I'm directly involved in. The number's growing at the rate of about 30 a year. Yes, I do invest a lot of money in startups. I've been very lucky in my career in calling it right. And gen like, in general, not 100%. Nobody can be 100%. I've lost a handful of companies, fortunately so far. No bankruptcies, there's been 150 so far. Numbers growing at about 30 a year. Why am I doing this? It's because the opportunities are there, that's why. And collaboration is a huge thing. There are some people in life that simply cannot share. They just can't, they have to own it, end of story. In my case, I'd rather own a couple of percent of IBM than 100% of a totally owned corner shop. That, like, that's, that's my style. I like to share, I like to communicate, and sure, other people will get, will get rich out of it. And that's fine with me. I like the sharing, I like the global. So I have a scheme which is called Go Global Fast, and I'm in many countries, it wouldn't be a surprise to you. I'm in Turkey, why Turkey? 80 million people growing at five, six percent a year. It's a fast-growing society, well-educated. I'm into Indonesia, it's growing like at a ferocious rate. But you have to think about where you get yourself involved. It's not just money, it's also time. And think about how you get involved. 
much better if you get involved with business people that are local because they're already entwined in the society. And if they have skin in the game, you know they're gonna use their influence to help grow a young company. And that's, and if, one, it's a lot of fun. Two, there's a great return. But you have to think global fast at this time. And what's going on is not just UK, not just Europe, it's global. You have to keep remembering, if you don't do business in the US, you're a nobody. If you don't do business in China, you're a nobody. You have to think globally, and there are some countries you must be in India, as an example. I hope that helped. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? <coughs> no, Terry, let's talk about... Oh, Chris, you know there. Chris? Sorry, Chris? Well, it's easy. Look at the hump. See the hump on the back? <laughs> Look at the bags under the eyes, and you have to be prepared to travel, and you have to enjoy what you're doing. And the important thing is not to get too uptight. If, you, if you're somebody that gets really upset easily, just don't get into this business. It has to be like water off a duck's back. And just keep working with people. And by the way, always the company and the success is about the team. The first item is team. Second item that's important is the team. Third item is the team. If I've forgotten about something, it's still about the team. Make sure the team is good. I mean, you imagine starting up a hotel, and, I, and I'm getting back to this, simply because of the team. So you think about this team. It's at Newport, which is a rundown industrial town. For six years out of seven, it's been the best hotel in the UK. Are you serious? It pulled in the 2010 Ryder Cup. Are you serious? It pulled in the NATO World Summit with two aircraft carriers in the Bristol Channel. Fighter jets on the fairway. That little bit, frankly, I would have changed, but you have to take it with, you know, what it comes with. You imagine 53 leaders around the world sitting at that hotel. And a funny story, I asked my partner, Simon Gibson, to make sure that he talked to the Prime Minister of Canada, that I was waiting to see the Prime Minister of Canada. So Simon, very nicely, he just said, um, Prime Minister, unfortunately, everyone turned around. They were all Prime Ministers. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry and I talk, I'm gonna add to this, um, about a problem that we both have, and I think it's a problem you guys almost certainly have as well. And I was pleased to hear that Terry does this as well. And that is with a great passion for our business and innovation and that. We talked about picking up your phone in the middle of the night and what it does to your patterns because if it's a really interesting mail and Terry says he does it, I do it, and I'm sure you do it. And it's something we've all got to learn to deal with. But it also adds to this whole drive, passion and the way you behave to keep things moving at pace. Particularly on a global scale as we talked about is it's round the clock all the time. You've got to look after yourself as well, which we, we were... Well, yeah, if you're passionate and, and you really enjoy what yeah. you're doing, it's more like a hobby than anything else. Yeah. One of the things that I've done over the last three years is pull together a thing called Sengen, Center of Excellence for Next Generation Networks and Services. Fortunately, I've persuaded both the Canadian government and the government in the UK to fund Sengen like a big test bed. I am very passionate about this, next, ne this uh, next network problem, whether it's fiber, whether it's G dot fast, whether it's broadband wireless, this has to be got right. Otherwise, the services and solutions sitting on them, yeah. like well, they, what can you do without a network? Huh? That's a good question. What do you do without a network? Yeah. So this next generation is totally fundamental to the next generation of going digital. Absolutely. So the organization Sengen is in the UK and it's also in Canada. And the budgets were quite generous in this regard. So uh, I, for those that are interested in, uh, in whether it's in BT, we had a good discussion uh, this morning. Yeah. Uh, so it, it would be good to find ways of, again, partnering when things are new, you have to test 
In particular, you have to test for the integration of these things to make them work properly. So partnerships for Sengen, then you get a North American environment partnering with a UK environment. It isn't just something sitting on its own. So I just want to pick up on our last point, which is the role of young people in innovation in your mind. We're going to talk about the future in a minute, their future. What's your views on young people and innovating and being involved in what you do? Well, remember when you were young, Steve, the word apprentice? Yeah. You know, there's, there's not as many apprenticeships today as there were in our day, as an example, when we were young. But I always like to think in terms of average age. The bigger an organization is, you better keep a look at average age. If you don't keep that average age going down, a little at least, if it's getting an older average age, you're not really feeding it with the right young people coming in. And, and, and the word right young people is very important. Now I'm kind of lucky because in starting up lots of companies, most of them are actually mainly populated by young grads and people with slightly graying hair that's been through it before. The best mentor of the lot is often somebody that used to work at Deloitte's. I overstated the Deloitte's, but nevertheless, somebody that used to be from the world of finance and accounting. Because young people, they, they, they may absolutely not understand the importance of that financial side, which was talked about earlier. The other thing is the importance to remember, it's about sales. Every time I have a review with a team, my first question is not how many lines of code. First question is, what was sales last quarter? Once they answer that, I say, what were the sales the previous quarter? Let me look at the quarterly report that you put out. Well, you didn't put out a quarterly report. That's also bad. You see an ability to actually record what you're doing. Some investor in a year's time will say, what is the company up to? What's the team doing? Well, Read our last four quarterly reports. Oh, you do quarterly reports. The message is even bigger then, because if they invest, there'll be another report next quarter. Very few people like throwing money over a wall and hope that it grows. They want to know what's going on, because so they've got skin in the game. One or two last comments. What would your advice be to people at school today about wanting to create the future, be involved in technology and make it happen. What were the two things that you would say that they should think about? First of all, get to communicate well, irrespective of what business you're in. This business of quarterly reports, an ability to explain what you're doing and why. And always remember that if there's somebody with a little gray in hair that's done it before, expect them to give you mentorship again and like, the most important thing is mentorship. The trouble with young people is they don't know what they don't know. Terry, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. We could be here all day, I'm sure, and everybody would enjoy every minute of it. So thank you very much.